Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Mm-hmm. Assalamu alaikum. Mm-hmm. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to another episode of Let's Jaliawala. I can't be I couldn't be happier. I have somebody uh, who has been one of the few people who has helped me tremendously throughout this and not just me, but this entire sector of learning and development in Pakistan. Uh, something magical happened back in 91. That's the time Kamran Rizvi came back to Pakistan and started this form of training in the country. And since then, I think there's been no stopping. This has turned into a movement. Many, many organization uh, organizations, many, many learning professionals have come out of this work. Uh, thousands of uh, institutions have been impacted, built capacity of, trained on various skills and all traces back a lot of it to this man who is not willing to admit that it's him who has caused this. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that he has a huge role to play in this. Uh, couldn't be happier, Kamran Rizvi. Thank Islam you, Kamran Bhai. Islam alaikum. Thank you for being on the show. You mean a lot. It's my pleasure. I was looking forward to it. Thank you. And uh, uh, the profile introduction, you know, we keep hearing them. Everybody mm. announces us with the same. But how do you define uh, in your own words? Well, I mean, I would say that I'm a man on a mission. Um, the mission being developing the human factor, elevating the human spirit, cultivating yeah. distinction and um, convey meaning and create significance. Mm. So these are some ideas that I really subscribe to, believe in, and uh, passionately pursue, and like to associate with people who are Mm. driven by similar germs, if I may put it that way. Yeah, and uh, help us understand this more, you know, people people go out to develop products, they make, you know, things that they can sell, and your work is is people, and you say developing people. So are you offering a degree program, you know, how do you place yourself in this field of development? If you, I look at it in two ways, I mean, reality has the physical dimension and a psychological one. Mm. So the planet Earth is the physical dimension. Yeah. And the surrounding cosmos is also in the physical sciences. And it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for who we are as individuals. Mm -hmm. Because look at our size, look at our scale. I mean, we can be measured in such a tiny box. And yet we have the capacity to encompass the vastness of the universe. So in some ways, what I find is that um, if one wants to understand the magnitude of one's potential, the one's capacity, uh, the universe is the evidence of it. And um, it is the sense we make of it. Mm. It's the wonder, it's the awe, the amazement that um, causes me to realize that, oh, I am on this planet, so everyone is. So this is true for everyone. Um, I don't know where the sense of deprivation or not having something or scarcity came from. But just imagine, I mean, you are alive, wherever you go, that place comes to life. Wherever you go, you sneeze and people turn to watch what happened. And where you are not, you are dead to that place. Uh, It doesn't matter what's happening in New York. I mean, right now, California is burning, but you're not concerned by that somehow, because it's so far away. But when you get there, Mm -hmm. things will happen. People will receive you. They will be amazed by the fact that you came and it will come to life. So human beings and every human being on this planet is blessed with a mind, is blessed with a soul, is blessed with uh, physical capacity to not only benefit himself or herself, but to benefit others. And I feel that this realization is missing significantly because I find people living a life uh, of survival, you know, earning their bread, paying their bills, taxes, and living a burdensome life, which I think is, uh, animals don't do that. They don't have any burdens. I mean, have you ever seen a horse stressed? (laughs) I don't know why we humans get stressed. Just because we think doesn't mean we need to be stressed. Thinking is to liberate us. It is not for us to just use as a factory for worries. Wow. And uh, I mean, these are great, great ideas. And, uh, you know, for everyone, there's a big anchor in life, you know, some core operating system, some belief system for human beings. What is that for you? What is the big anchor in your life when it comes to beliefs? The word belief itself is a very important uh, phenomena because whatever you believe is true. So if you say you can, 
you, you're right. If you say you can't, you're right. If you think the world sucks, you're absolutely right. And if you say, oh my God, there is so much to do in this world, uh, that's okay. So, I mean, belief is that phenomena that I think is a gift from God to everyone. Choose what you want to believe. Wow. And believe that which will serve you and others in a beautiful way. So, you know, we can uh, be assets, uh, we can be resourceful, we can be um, uh, inspiring, or we can be depressed, we can be sad, we can be uh, martyrs, and extremely you know, depressing. So it could be constructive, it could be destructive. Depends on it's so, the belief that so you what, have. So what beliefs did you hold on to? Is, well, is it this very power that you could be constructive at any given well, point? You see, it, it all begins with our, our, our beginnings, you know. When we were born, the environment we had. I was lucky, I was fortunate in the sense that um, my parents believed in my potential, in the sense that they would say to me that I'm very intelligent but lazy. Mm. Um, and, and that, that was exactly. drummed into me. And the fact that um, I, I was an angry individual when I was young, um, oh, amazingly <laughs> angry. I mean, like, I think um, most teenagers have this sense of, I know it, the rest are crazy. Yeah. So that phase I went through, and I recall that I couldn't see any sense in education or in some vocations people pursued, and I would always fantasize. Uh, but then I realized later on when I did the Dale Carnegie course back in 1981 that, hey, there are others who think as well. And that then dawned on me that my perspectives are just mine and everyone has a worldview. And I need to, in order to progress in life, uh, I need to learn those worldviews as well. So I, I feel that beliefs um, were you know, created in me uh, and also chosen by me later um, that serve me very well today. Now, what are those beliefs? The belief is that there is no bad news. There is, um, no, there is no bad news. Okay, there is no bad news. There is no bad news in life other than the ones we create for ourselves. Um, I believe this firmly. And the fact that I die and you die and we all are mortal beings, I mean, that's not bad news. Bad news is uh, going without having made a difference. Um, that's bad news and that is of our own creation. And I feel that a lot of people who are leading a negative life, a life which is depressing or worrying, uh, it's not their fault. We haven't reached out to them yet. And I think awareness, the light of awareness has to reach out. And I often um, talk about this lately, uh, fog. Now imagine what happens in a fog. If you're driving on a motorway and visibility is 500 yards, you'll be cautious, but you'll still be driving at around 60 to 80 kilometers an hour. But if that visibility drops to 50 yards, you'll slow down. And if it drops to five yards, you will stop. And you'll put on your hazard lights, hoping no one misses you. And I find that that fog metaphor is very true in our lives as well. Because if you notice, when you can't see clearly, you cease to move. You, you are paralyzed, you are fearful, you are afraid, you don't know what to do. This fog surrounds us in the psychological world as well. We hear of this VUCA world, yeah. volatile, yeah. uncertain, chaotic, ambiguous, and this is a fog. And th in this fog, what happens? People become fearful, they slow down, they take a pause, they don't know what to do, and as a result, there's inertia. And that paralysis is what slows organizations down, which slow national development down, because people are just not, they're not able to see. Yeah. Now, what do you do in, in situations like that? You bring clarity to the situation. You don't bring certainty to it, you bring clarity to it. And clarity is what I find is what gives you the, the foresight and the ability to move and navigate through the, through the paths. But if you can't see where you are, you're fumbling. And fumbling is never artistic, is it? Right? So clarity gives you the ability to navigate through challenges that you face. And, and that comes through awareness. It's great. And that, that feeds into the next question as well. Clarity about, about success. You know, yes. what, you know, many people have many definitions of yes. success. 
Uh, how have you defined success in all this while? So we know you've been going around, you're on the run most of the time, you've impacted hundreds of thousands of people through your seminars, through your workshops. Uh, you've started organizations, you've moved on from organizations, you've seen your own people sort of do so much. Uh, in all of that, uh, fast forward to where you are, 28 years old, what is success for you? You know, uh, again, you're wanting my perspective. There is no one answer to this. Um, success, number one, has to be defined by the individual and not by society. And I find a lot of people living the script um, which has been crafted by others. Um, so therefore, uh, let's get rid of that script and choose our own definition. So your viewers and listeners, and I, I would urge them to decide for themselves as to what success is. Um, in my perspective, as, as I see it, it is the ability to bounce back after a fall. And the harder you fall, the harder you bounce back, which is never giving up. And um, you never fail until you quit. So once you have decided to pursue a goal, uh, you just carry on regardless. You just carry on regardless. That's one part. Failure is fertilizer for success. If you're not failure willing, failure is fertilizer for success. Is, yeah, failure is a fertilizer for success. If you're not um, prepared to fail, then don't even think of uh, achieving anything in life. You know, like a boxer, I can throw a punch. I can really knock you out, but can I take a punch? So if I can't take a punch, I shouldn't even dare to throw one. So I, I feel that life is about ups and downs, and can you imagine if you have 20 downs and you come back every time? What fun that is. No pain, no gain. No, gain, no pain, no gain. So life is never a trajectory which is a, a diagonal line going straight up. It's waves. And I feel that riding the waves and celebrating that and not taking social pressure in the process um, is what makes it. And I'll tell you, I mean, when I started out, and this is advice to any startup, um, I started out with the worst case scenario, I prepared for it, and the best case scenario. And frankly, if anyone is getting into any business, before they do that, they should ask themselves, what can go wrong? And can I survive that? If they can't survive it in their head, they shouldn't even embark. Yeah. Now, the worst case scenario I had was that, look, I'm entering into a field of learning and development. I don't know how well it will be received in this country. There is no tradition or culture of mass learning and development across the board. But I want to do it. It's a passion I have. So what's the worst that's going to happen? The market won't buy. So no revenue, how do I fulfill my obligation? Yeah, nobody's going to buy. Nobody's gonna no one buys, no revenue. How do I make sure my kids get the education they deserve? Uh, how do I you know, function in a city? So I decided, OK. The worst case scenario is I just book a Suzuki van and go to a village, talk to an elder and say, listen, I want two meals a day for myself and my family and I will in return teach your community whatever I know. And I realize that no matter which village I go to, they'll accept me with open arms. They will, definitely. Yeah. And all I need is a charpai and sleep. So. I got so relaxed by the fact that the worst case scenario is beautiful. I can deal with that. Hence, I came forward and I then started to... Can I, can I interpret it as, um, you know, for you, for you to be thinking that, that level of, um, uh, you know, what can go wrong and the worst of, worst of it. And you've told me this many a times. And it has always made, always made me think that it's, it's the ego that stops people from thinking those possibilities. You know, the ego to carry a certain status, to stay in a certain place, to carry a certain label. If you minus all of that, you know, there are easier answers. Many easy answers. Most of our problems are driven by our ego and our uh, sense of where we are in relation to others and the standards that have been set for us. I think uh, it's absolute baloney. It's nonsense to fall into that trap. Uh, and here I, I must confess, you know, Bob Marley, uh, he, he said something so beautiful and I always like to quote it. And I'm so happy that when I do, quite a few already know it. You know, some people are so poor that all they have is money. I mean, to me, that is a hugely profound saying. 
The other thought that I carry with me like this is that uh, we are not defined by what we have. We are not defined by what we have. We are defined by who we are. That is true wealth. And I find that the having part has overtaken the being part uh, in a lot of places. You know, we live in image as opposed to reality. Um, taking another example, for me, I've yet to come across an ugly human being. Now, when I say that in a forum or in a gathering, they think I'm patronizing them or I'm flattering them because surely there must be some handsome and some beautiful and some ugly people in the, in the hall. And I say, look, what I see is not what I speak of because that is pure packaging. You know, when you get a gift on a birthday, it's wrapped, isn't it? In colorful paper with ribbon and tassels and everything else. How long do you keep it that way? You go rip yes. and you want to see what's inside. So what I see, Umair Jaliawala, or what you see, Kamran Rizvi, these, this is just the surface. And we have crafted our lives around the surface. When the real Jaliawala is not what I see, it's what's inside him. And to be able to have that view of a person, beauty lies there. And Seerat is everything. So we are defined not by what we have, but by who we are. This is wonderful. It's a, it's a marathon of ideas. Um, uh, just, um, just one quick question to, to make this happen. What are the disciplines that you've embraced and that you'd never compromise on? One discipline that I have embraced and I'm proud of and I'm very conscious of is time. And I find that um, time is the phenomena by which God swears. Allah ne vakt ki kasam khai hai. Now God doesn't have to swear to anything. I mean, He is omnipresent and He's, I mean, you can't define God, right? He's all over. And He was never born, he was, uh, He'll never die. I mean, there's no place in the universe or in a particle yeah. that doesn't have his presence. But he swears by time. Only, I feel, to convey to all of us the importance of time. Mm -hmm. And in our culture, time And what is time is it? Is crushed. it the time on the, on the clock or is it the times we live in? It's, it's time in terms, I mean, time is life. And time is not... Um, 24 hours. Time is what you make of the moment. And this reminds me of William Blake and his poem. Uh, and I would like that to be on my tombstone when I die. Um, he says that uh, to see the world in a grain of sand. To see the world in a grain of sand. And heaven in a wild flower. To hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. So time has to be treasured, has to be valued. So it's not about the quantum. It's about what you take out of the moments that you have. So and, I mean, certain experiences are lifetime, even though they're very short, they're very brief. Yes, this time. and it's in moments that big things have happened. Yeah. We were conceived in our mother's wombs in milliseconds. Look at the manifestation. Such a huge happening. We were on the disciplines and you were speaking about time. Do you want to finish it? Or? Yes, I would like to say that um, uh, that uh, conceptual and philosophic side of time is one. The other is uh, if I respect human beings. I mean, for me, another discipline is respect. And respect is very closely tied with time. So if I give an appointment to someone and if I'm not there at that time, that is huge disrespect. And I feel that um, if in society we learn to respect the time of others, and um, not only respect our own time, I think that discipline in itself is a very bonding experience. Um, these two are the core, I would say. You said three. Yeah. I mean, there could be others, but I'd like to uh, keep it to so time, time and respect. respect. These are two and very the solid ones. And the third time you've had uh, the same answer, time and respect. Yes, yes. These are amazing. And there's um, lots more, but I would yeah. restrict myself to these sure. pinnacles. 
uh, in in making what would all you've been able to make and uh, or be part of perhaps you know that's how you would like to term it and of course to, alongside that you had your own journey your mm. own personal life relationships are critical and, oh, yes. know, oh, yes. to us social beings how yeah. do you define relationships what do they mean to you relationships in my view are the very essence of why we are here on this planet mm. because it is um, through relationships that we earn peace and joy and happiness and health and uh, nirvana mm -hmm. um, and whenever we talk of relationships it's about sincerity mm -hmm. and sincerity stems from um, being 100% present with whomsoever you are not to be divided or distracted by devices mm -hmm. or any other um, element mm -hmm. I, for example right now you're 100% here mm -hmm. And I feel that without relationships, you can do nothing in life. Mm -hmm. um, big things happen when you have lots of people sure. moving in that direction. Absolutely. They don't have to be formally associated mm -hmm. with you. Uh, so one relationship that I really enjoy is that of humanity. Mm -hmm. um, the best part is they don't know where I am. They mm -hmm. don't know who I am. And the fact is that when uh, they're doing good, I feel I'm so lucky. If they're doing good, I feel lucky because we're all in the same journey. Whoever is doing good wherever, I make myself a part of that. And no strings attached. Isn't that beautiful? Mm. So I often ask a question to people, which is, what do you earn? And I don't want you to answer this. What do you earn and where do you live? And whatever your answer in your head, um, I often get the look of, yeah, why is he asking such personal questions? Where do I live? Okay, I live in Banigala, but earn? I mean, that's a mm. invasive. So I say, look, if you're not earning goodwill, and if you're not living in the hearts of people, whatever you're doing, that's bullshit. Mm. Pardon my French. Yeah. Whatever you're doing is bullshit. Wow. Earn goodwill. Earn and goodwill and live in hearts. Uh -huh. But don't tell your spouse. You're quite a piece of <laughs> Don't tell your spouse. <laughs> Because I was about to say you're quite a preacher. <laughs> <laughs> That's the danger in this. However, I mean it from a perspective of, um, you know, higher love. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. love which transcends this um, man-woman mm -hmm. thing yeah. and is more about humanity and nature sure. and stuff like that. So relationships are the taste of life, yeah. really. And there is pain and joy associated with that. Sure. And they test you. And uh, I feel that... Uh, unless the metal is tested, how do you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so in a sense, they are mirrors the to you as well. The metal must go through the grind. They are mirrors oh. to you and they are very important. And they, they give you the context. And frankly, when you strive for something, notice when you share pain with others, it's mm -hmm. halved. When you share joy with others, it multiplies. It's doubled, yes. yes. When you share pain, it's halved. When you share joy, it's yeah. multiplied. And the act is the same. The act is the same. Sharing. Oh. And... Um, but this is how beautiful it is. There's no meaning in life mm -hmm. if you're alone, on your own, completely. We're not, mm -hmm. we are connected. Yeah. We are all connected. Wow. Um, I want to know three stories. And I know you have a whole lot of um, mm -hmm. stories to tell from yeah. all these sectors and your participants. But pick one from your family, pick one from your organizations and pick one from your... Um, the participants, the huge alumni force that you have mm. across Pakistan and abroad as well. That's a very structured way of asking me to dig out uh, stories. There are many, uh, yeah. but let me but start. I want something from your life, one thing from your work, and, yeah. and one thing that you've been able to create in the society. Yeah. So one story that really resonates with me is Quetta, mm. 2010. Mm. Um, I'm going to the airport. I've entered the airport. I've put my trolley bag and my um, laptop bag in the x-ray machine. Uh, ASF officers are, are in front of me. Mm. And as I place my baggage on the x-ray machine, the guy asks, Aap kahan se hai? where are you mm. from? So I responded very spontaneously. Main to isi mitti se hun. And my saying that, he left his station and started moving towards me. I was petrified. I'm in Quetta, mm -hmm. and this ASF uniformed officer is moving towards me rapidly, comes through the metal detector, and grabs me. 
uh, but then I tur it turned out not to be a grab, it was a hug. And it was a tight hug. I've never been hugged like that by anyone. Um, and then I sensed he was crying. And I also, in sympathy, um, became tearful. 15, 20 seconds. And then when we sort of parted uh, and we looked at each other, there was a sense of oneness. I mean, he came from somewhere, I came from another place. All our backgrounds, cultures, ethnicities, they just fell by the wayside human connection. So yes. that I can never forget, that hug mm -hmm. and that moment. Um, another story that um, I, I can narrate uh, to you is uh, relate, this was an experience, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and to me, you know, family is everyone. Mm -hmm. My son, my daughter, my wife, my mother, I mean, family to me, these are, you see, if I were to um, describe it in another way, we are, we all start our lives in families. We have parents, they guide us, they coach us, they bring us to being where we are. They play a huge role in our lives. But our home is our first university. It's our first university. Now what does a university want you to do? Step out and contribute. That's exactly what a family is. So these are natural institutions created by God. And if one steps out of a family and does good outside in society and treats others with the same love that they've received, family. Sure. So um, specific family stories are a bit hard because everyone is family, you know? No, no, I get that. Um, but I can say that um, uh, with my dad, and, and before he passed away, um, interestingly, I mean, he asked me, I was on an assignment with a client and uh, rolling out values. And he texted me very unusually, saying that, um, could you send me the handout you're using in this exercise so that I can work on it? So I replied by saying, I'm not using a handout. I'm simply using a process. If you're interested, I will run it by you when I come. He says, do that. I met him and um, this was just about three months before he went to the other world. And this conversation was so simple, so beautiful, that in all these years, this is the first time I met my dad in that way, that small conversation. So I realized that moments in time, at, on occasions, can just be those precious few minutes or hours that you spend with someone and they have left an indelible mark on me so that story was amazing that deep conversation which I was having with my dad mom trying to interrupt as she usually does but on that particular day I would say no no not now mom I'm in a conversation and it went on for about a real conversation yes and the third story and I think this is again a family story um, when I went to boarding school um, Mom and Dad were having some a tough time, I suppose. I was six years old, Lawrence College. And I remember we were, our home was in Dhaka. She had come to Murray and had admitted me here. And I had never been away from home. And at that age, oh yes. I still remember hugging the tree as she walked away. What did that mean to you? Love, yeah. connect. It was so, you know, detachment, attachment, all of that happened. Uh, so what I feel is that, you know, deep relationships are deep and you can um, gauge them like that. Thank you for the lovely stories. I'd also like you to narrate the, the D.I. Khan one, something that you've yes. told us over and over. Yes, I mean, D.I. Khan example, the story is remarkable in that um, I was there in 2011 in a sugar mill and it was an assignment on organization development and visioning, etc. And it culminated with a, 
an event where all employees, including the owners and managers, were to be together. 800 of them in a shamiana. Okay. And out there in their compound. So the format was panel discussion similar to this. And we had, uh, you know, different people come on stage and I had planned for 12. And not from amongst the managers or owners, mm -hmm. but from amongst the workers okay. who normally just sit there waiting for their chai and samosa. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would just go into the hall, uh, you know, on the aisle and just mm -hmm. pick on someone and bring him to stage and mm -hmm. then have a nice little yeah. conversation with him. Um, I noticed that there were about 85 or 90 uh, conservatively attired individuals with mm -hmm. beards, etc. So I thought diversity and inclusion is something that I believe in. So why not include them as mm. well? So I got one of the bearded gentlemen yeah. to come on stage. And um, as I was speaking with him, I found he, his voice had depths. He was fluent and he was very articulate. So I asked him of his profession and he said, I am the imam of the masjid in the area. Mm. May I say, la ke masjid ka imam hu. So I said, oh, wonderful. So then he continued praising the company, the owners. Mm. And in his um, um, ex passion, Joshe um, Khitabat, mm. he says, Hum musulmano ko yakja ho kar, kuffar ko nis to naboot kar dena hai. He said that. And uh, f for a moment, I said, oh, my God, now, you know, what do I do? Mm. And my reaction was a judgment. The judgment was that what he's saying is wrong. And then I realized, isn't that prejudice? That I'm prejudging? Um, if I remain silent, um, you know, I'm condoning the thought, which I haven't even understood. And if I t confront him, mm -hmm. it may result in uh, derailing the whole project. Yeah. And I need to get home as well. Mm. Um, so I then realized, no, my bias has to come out of this. Mm. I have to understand where he's coming from. Sure. And um, so I became his student. And I asked him a question that, sir, what you said confused me. And is it all, all right if I ask you to explain it? So he said, yeah, sure. And he was quite happy to. Mm. And in that, I first repeated what he said in my own words for the audience. So that I didn't want to lose them. Yeah. And um, I said, what I understood from what you said was that there are 7 billion people living on this planet Earth mm. and one and a half to two billion who are Muslims should get together, unite and make plans to destroy the rest. That's what I think you said. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to be sure that we are on the same page. He said we are. Now, when he said that, now the audience was also engaged in this. Mm -hmm. um, I said, my confusion stems from what I've been hearing from my childhood. And from my childhood, I've heard that um, about God, that he is the provider for all of mankind. Uh, Rabbul Alameen hai. Um, and not Rabbul Muslimin. He's not just the provider for Muslims, the sustainer of Muslims. So is that correct? Because my elders and yeah. my exposure to, to knowledge has given me this insight. I don't know if this is right or not. So he says, you're absolutely right. Then I said, um, being a Muslim, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is known to us as a blessing for mankind. That's what I've been hearing. He's a blessing for each and every individual on this planet Earth. And yeah, as Muslims, uh, Rahmatul Lil Alameen. Yeah. Um, and this is something that as followers, uh, we need to be a blessing for every human being on this planet. Um, and everyone must feel safe in our presence. Um, but he's not rahmatul lil muslimin from what I have heard. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, what is your take on that? So he says, yeah, that's true. He is a blessing for mankind. I said, well, this doesn't sit very easily with what you shared. I don't know how this reconciles. So this gentleman went quiet for a few seconds and he said ye jo maine kaha tha asal mein mere dil ka mail tha what i said was essentially the dirt of my heart not to for him to have uh, 
publicly in front of his constituents mm. yeah. in a matter of three minutes. This whole dialogue took three minutes. Uh, I hear mm. shared some of my own reflections. There I didn't. It was happening in my subconscious. His saying that was miraculous mm -hmm. because then I could see the world healing right there yeah. because it was that sense of clarity that prevailed. Mm. And I feel that this is the most liberating. Yeah. What about reconciling the exactly. beliefs in the world? Exactly. I mean, and so we got up, we hugged each other, and there was a sense of energy in the room that was so positive, I can't tell you. So this story is something that uh, lives with Thank me, you. and um, okay. I'm glad that you gave was me that, the opportunity. Um, is that, um, you know, as a trainer, I can share this, you know, a lot of times clients ask, so what curriculum are yeah. we delivering? And yeah. of course there's a curriculum, but I think it's more about sort of liberating people of, you know, where they're stuck, there's yes. knots in everybody's head. Yes. You know? yes. And if you're able to work through that, yes. I think it uh, that is that is what stops people from most things. It's yes. not that people it's can't. Our, it's our biases, it's mm -hmm. our prejudices, it's our uh, assumptions about others. It's our ignorance, frankly. Mm -hmm. And all of us are ignorant. I am ignorant yes. on so many things. So I take this attitude of a student wherever I go. So if something doesn't make sense, I try to understand. And in the process, Mm. All human beings ultimately want to learn. Absolutely. And I was speaking to this law enforcement agent uh, just the other day. And, um, you know, it occurred to me that the mission of law enforcement must be to ensure that no one goes to hell. Mm. No one on this planet goes to hell. Because only then um, can we be human. For example, if anyone has committed a crime, only for his atonement should he be punished so that the load that he carries is lightened mm -hmm. with the intention. Yes. Yeah. So that we can say that may, God, he has paid for what he did. Yeah. Save and him. Not, and not that for life, but for the time that you yes. know, uh, he has paid the price. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's been punished for what he did. He's atoned himself. Oh. Please spare I think him. I don't understand the term atonement like that. Um, I'd like in the last two questions, one about three books that you would recommend yes. and why. Yes. And not the usual listings that we get, but three books that you would really, really mm. recommend with all your heart yeah. uh, that we must read and why. Mm. And uh, three ideas about Pakistan. Yeah. So the first um, book that certainly I would urge everyone to read is... Um, the Messenger by Tariq Ramadan. Uh, mm -hmm. I found that book to have come at a time when I needed uh, guidance. Mm -hmm. And it is based around Prophet Muhammad Wasallam's life and the challenges he faced. It's not a biography as much as it is the difficulties he faced and how he, with his team he to navigate, through navigate them. through them. And um, I found that the, the best part about the book was that it's written for non-Muslims. Mm -hmm. So the language is very plain and very simple and very yeah. um, digestible. Sure. So and, and I found it full of insights. Okay, so um, the messenger by Tariq Ramadan. The messenger by Tariq Ramadan. Dale Carnegie course was the first one I ever did in 1981, and that was my first course ever. My life altered significantly after that. That's why I'm a believer in training and learning and development, sure. because I know that it makes a huge difference. It's made it in my life, so it has to in others as well. Knowledge liberates. So how to win friends and influence people, how to stop worrying and start living, how to grow up and not grow old. Now, mm -hmm. Dale Carnegie is one book, <laughs> one man. <laughs> but here are three books that I've just yes. mentioned. I can't forget those. Wow. They really were transformative in my life. And notice, I keep saying yeah. I'm 28. So I have grown up, but I'm not growing old. Yeah, I was 18 in 2004. Yeah. You were 28 yes. <laughs> on stage. Yes. It's the first time I saw yeah. trainers in action. And this 2018 now, I'm 32 and you're still 28. <laughs> I, <laughs> age is a number. Youth is an attitude. So yeah. I, I, I maintain the fact that wow. being youthful mm. is something that we can carry right, right to our grave. And... Yeah, we get old, we, our body starts to squeak and, mm -hmm. you know, become uncomfortable. But who cares, mm -hmm. so long as you're youthful in your heart. And, and therefore, I love working at School of Leadership, for example, 
because it gives me the opportunity to be with young people. Mm. And often I find them older than I am. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that to me is fascinating, fascinating. That's true. Uh, and I must say that um, coming to Pakistan, look, I've, you bargained for three. Mm. Yes. I gave you four books, three of Dale Carnegie's and one The Messenger. Mm. There are, are many other books with that I could have mentioned, but I think these are enough to mm. start get going, okay. get going with. Um, my f Facebook profile has many books there. My mm. website has it. Now, when it comes to three things about Pakistan, about three ideas about three Pakistan. Three ideas about Pakistan. You know, Pakistan is a 71-year-old country. It's a young country. And it has human beings, like every country has human beings, and they're all miraculous. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're all miraculous. They can do things. Uh, what is, what three ideas I have for Pakistan? Number one, tap into the love tap into the generosity of this nation. Everyone that I've met, mm. deep down, has been a gem. It's just about digging mm. into the souls that there are. Wow. We have 220 million or so people in Pakistan, and this population is growing. But I have a feeling that um, this nation has the resilience mm. um, that we can tap into, sure. and also be fair to them. So that's the first idea for Pakistan that so I tap feel into the love and generosity of in, in our society. And it's a beautiful country. And sure. whatever we see wrong with it, mm. it's not wrong in that we have been negligent. We mm. have been very, sure. very negligent. Our 70 years have been pomp and ceremony. Yeah. They've not been about real living. The second idea about Pakistan is that, yes, we have so many problems. And it is uh, 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 it, it is a, kya kahenge, it's a gold mine. Mm -hmm. It's a gold mine for people who are problem solvers. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that the entrepreneurial culture has started. Yeah. Because we need people who identify issues in our society and turn them into business propositions yeah. that are beneficial. So yes, entrepreneurship is the second. And the third idea I feel is that we need to turn Pakistan into an inspiration for the world. That is the thing I will settle for. I don't want us to be capped by Pakistan. I want Pakistan to be a symbol of what all nations can be. Uh -huh. Now, that is a 400-year vision, 500-year vision. Sure. And I believe that that potential wow. resides here. We have the talent. We have the energy. We have the wisdom. We have the legacies of our yeah. elders. And if you can turn around this, it is quite a story. Yes, it's and it may not be in our lifetimes. Yeah. Sure. I must uh, cl conclude this segment of Pakistan and any other, that, you know, if people lose sight of their mortality, they don't know how to live. You know, you and I can pop any time. It's not about when we pop. It's mm -hmm. about ensuring that even if we do, whatever we are part of continues. It's in the continuance that we live. Socrates it's may have died so many. Yeah. So we must ensure that whatever we do carries ah. to Armageddon. There could have been no better way to end this, or at least end this conversation. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And Likewise. You spilled out so much in this. <laughs> Likewise. And I hope that uh, our people are able to sort of digest through this. KZR.co is one website that represents Kamran's work in Pakistan uh, since 91. Uh, the other organizations are School of Leadership, um, sol.edu.pk. Then there's Carnelian, which is the corporate front for Kamran Bhai and his team. Um, so these are the names that can help you dig more and find more from Kamran Bhai. And also he is um, he's a very accessible, available trainer, mentor, coach available, and he is founded many, many forums, and I hope that you come across his work uh, sooner uh, than just meeting him physically. Yes. You know that I meet on Sundays from 7 to 10 a.m. on Skype. Yes. So on Sundays, 7 to 10 a.m. is the Skype time. Aadhe log uti nahi paate. Baaki aadhe jod paate. That's my way of filtering. So they can always email and schedule. Yes, true that. Thank you very much, uh, Kamran Bhai, once again. And for all of you for watching. Until next time.